I guess you can guess, the pastor asked me to teach again. And uh, when I was looking at what to teach on, my wife was telling me that, make it a little bit more uplifting, you know. And I said, well, that's going to be ha- kind of hard to do, you know. But. So today we're going to be talking about the wedding day. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, our main text will be in chapter Psalms chapter 45. But in chapter 5 in Thessalonians, it says, But the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety and sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travaileth upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not born in darkness, that that day will overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. When Jesus Christ returns, he's, basically he's going to come as a thief in the night. So it's telling you he's coming in the night. Now I don't mean a literal night. I mean we're living in the night right now. Uh, if, if you had a, uh, a clock and you were looking at it, and if anybody's ever worked night shift, you know that 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning is when the thief is going to come. Because that's when you're fast asleep and you're, you're, you're in your REM sleep and you can't hardly wake anybody up when they're in their REM sleep. I've tried to wake my wife up a couple times and it's never worked. But that's where the church is today. We're all, basically the church is asleep. And the thief is about to come, but we're asleep. The church is at the point where it's not effective anymore in this world. And when it gets to a point where it's, it's lost, the salt has lost its savor, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have to take us out of here. And that's just what I got this morning. We're getting close to the wedding day. Are you, is your garments ready? Years ago, in the entertainment industry in this this country changed. And it basically told God that we're no longer promoting God because used to have, they used to have Bibles and they would even have Bible verses and you'd hear uh, Christian music on some videos, but not anymore. Everything is dark. They're saying that we're promoting the God of this world, and it's getting worse. I mean, I I dare say that if if you're going to movies or anything like that right now, you're, you're backslidden. You need to get right with the Lord because those movies are... I watch the trailers on them just to keep up with what's going on, and it's horrible. It's the very demonic. The U.S. government told God, you're not welcome here. We're in charge. So they kicked God out. And now they have all these other religions praying before Congress. The educational system that's controlled by the U.S. said get prayer out of schools Don't mention Jesus Christ and get your Ten Commandments out of here now. The United States local state government said, we don't want you here because we will get sued and we're not willing to pay the price. U.S. businesses, get out of here. We don't want to offend anyone. We're going to support the LGBTQRST rainbow flag. We worship money. That's all we're interested in. Now everything has gone to hell. The world is facing insanity. And in in addition to that, the churches and the people have said, 
We don't want your old Bible anymore. We want a new worldly inclusive Bible that doesn't offend and give us some programs so we can teach the people with our programs and not the Bible because we don't want to offend nobody. The world has kicked God out. And the world is such a mess. There's the, the violence in America has risen to the point where you can't even, you have to lock your doors, and if you, if you go anywhere, you better be armed. Amen. And the people in the churches are saying, where is God in all this? You kicked him out. For the last 40 years, and this is a positive message, believe me, for the last 40 years, I've seen the change, and I don't like it. It was bad when I was a, a young man, but now that I'm older, it scares me to death. Every day I read about women, men and women not getting married to each other, but marrying women, marrying women, and men marrying men, and they're marrying their, their, a tree. They're marrying the sea. And you can watch this. People actually think they're marrying the sea. They're marrying their chandeliers. I read about that this week. They're marrying their pets. And they're marrying their iPhones because they're so in love with their iPhones. The world has officially announced that it's insane. The world is screaming for help, but don't ask God. Everyone is trying to be seen and wanting to be loved by anything or anyone that will acknowledge that they exist or that they're great. Scientists are even coming up with pills to, to cure loneliness because people are so lonely because no one's communicating anymore. For decades, we've been bombarded by educators who's, and, and scientists who say, God does not exist. We're all alone. Do as you please. For generations, we've been growing up without the knowledge of God, and the human race is on a self-destructive course. They have filled their lives with despair and the longing to find a reason to live and if they don't find the truth, death ensues and hell ensues. In most cases, parents can't help their children because the parents are in the same condition their children are. Drowning in despair, never knowing the love of God, His compassion, and most important, I believe, is the hope that we have in Christ. Amen. That we're not, this is not all there is. All over the world, people are committing suicide. They closed an Air Force base down in South Carolina the other day because of too many suicides. These suicides come in the form of sex addiction, drug addiction, gang violence, devil worship, new age, crime, hate groups, and mass murder. They're all trying to, be, to fill that hole in their chest that Adam left when he rebelled against God. And the only one that can fill that hole in your chest is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, without God and His love, you can't cope in this world. You can't function. You've got to have Him. And the best news is there's still time. Psalms chapter 136 verse 12 says, With a strong hand, with a stretched out arm, for His mercy endureth forever. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 Jesus began his ministry by reading this passage. 
the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he, the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to opening of the prisons uh, to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, and oil for joy for the morning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, and the planting of our Lord, that he, that he might be glorified. Let's pray. Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, if you don't show up, we might as well all go home. I pray that you'll guide my heart, guide my mouth. Let no words proceed out of my mouth that are contrary to your word. Blessed be the Holy One of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. For asking Jesus Christ, amen. When you talk about a, a wedding, a wedding day, first you you got to have a, a bride and you have to have a groom. In most European weddings and and um, weddings in Israel, the first thing that had to be settled before an engagement took place is a dowry. You had to have a dowry. And the money had to be sufficient enough to where if something ever happened to you that she would be taken care of. When God looked at th th this earth, we are in such debt, the debt of sin, that Jesus Christ had to pay that debt before he, before he could get married. Every one of us are sinners. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, it says, Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sin that are passed through the forbearance of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 says, And having made peace through the blood of the, his cross, by him reconciled all things unto himself. And by him I say whether they be be things in earth or things in heaven. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. What a dowry. He paid a price that we could never pay. You could spend the rest of your eternity in hell and never pay the price that he paid. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. So he provides our faith, he finishes our faith, and he gets us through. What a deal! Have you accepted it? You say, yes, Lord. That's a good deal. The wedding invitation is a proposal of marriage. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, he says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And though they be red as like crimson, they shall be as wool. He also says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's your invitation. Whosoever. Amen. It's not the elect. It's not the uh, um, chosen one. Whosoever. 
Jesus himself said in John chapter 7, verse 37, says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the Scriptures has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the, the nicest thing about being saved is that is true. Now, I don't, I'm not one that come up here and say, you get saved and everything's good. You're in a battle. Just like every uh, engagement until the marriage happens, you're in a battle. You get cold feet. You have doubts. You have all kinds of things running through your mind before you get married. And you wonder if it's going to work. Judge chapter 1 verse 23 I've heard pastors say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to scare anyone to, into heaven. I want them to come, come to Jesus Christ in love. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus Christ will take you any way he can get you. You come to him in love, or like in Jude chapter 23, it says, and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. I was scared of hell. I was scared that if I died right then, I would go to hell, and I cried out to the Lord Jesus Christ to save me, and he did. As you can see, I'm nuts about Jesus Christ. The proposal, the bridegroom says, Come, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What a deal. If I wasn't married, which I am, and I'm happily married, thank God. If I wasn't a born-again Christian, I'd want to get saved all over again. In fact, I, I can't understand when I'm sitting up here and hearing the preacher preach and I'm, I'm hearing the gospel given. I said, man, I wish I was lost so I could get saved all over again. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For out of the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is the best part. Romans chapter 8 verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be it that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And a lot of us haven't suffered a lot, but if you're a born-again Christian living for the Lord Jesus Christ, the devil is constantly on your back. And if he ain't, you ain't doing something right. Then we get an engagement ring. And that engagement ring is a little different than what you normally get. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, In whom ye also trusted... After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That means that not only do I receive Him as my Savior, and He, and he, he, puts, his spirit in, he puts His Spirit in my heart, but He seals it so no one can get Him out. I can't even get Him out. I don't want to get him out. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I'm a new creature. And if you don't believe that you're a new creature, when you receive Jesus Christ, you'll find out that you're actually a new creature. You don't think the way you used to. You have one objective in life, and that's to, to see Jesus Christ and be face to face with him. But we do get a rock. Every woman has to have a rock. In Romans chapter 9 verse 33 says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. 
And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You know, when you're a single man and you're out there looking for a, a, a wife, you start looking at women's fingers to see if that rock is on their finger. If you see that rock on her finger, you know that, stand back, she's, she's been spoken for, she's been taken, she's not, she's not available. And that woman that has that rock on her finger is going, I want to tell you about my future husband and the life that we're going to have. He's so wonderful. That's the way you think when you're engaged. A woman should think that way. And he should be on her mind all the time. Amen. Is Jesus Christ on your mind all the time? Do you consider what he would do and how he would handle things? Every bridegroom gives gifts to remind her of him. Jesus Christ is no different. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4 it says, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. So he gives us gifts. A lot of us don't use our gifts the way we should. In Romans chapter 15 verse 13 it says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, isn't that interesting? Here we're in a world of despair. But as you, you as a believer have joy and hope. Amen. Thank God for that because you need it this day and age. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Thank God for our pastor. I mean, look at what the rest of the world has to deal with. we got a pastor that trusts the Lord, believes in his word. While the bridegroom's away, he's expecting the bride to think of him. Because she is on his mind. She, he wants her to be thinking about him all the time. Because he's thinking about her. And if you don't believe that, that Jesus Christ is thinking about you all the time, read your Bible. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Study to show thyself approval unto God, a workman need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Learn about him. Study him. You know, most women, if they don't study their wives before they get married, a lot of times they're disappointed when they get married. My wife thought I was perfect before we got married. And then she found out I was, I was a low-down, no-good bum, you know. But that, that's, that's what you do. You study that person. And she studies you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, it says, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business, to work with your hands as we command you. That means have a quiet spirit about you. Don't be loud. Don't be boisterous. Don't get into other people's business. Stay out of it. Mind your own and work. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 Brother Becker preached on this a while back. It says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, and that every one of those things is about Jesus Christ. You've got to keep pure. You gotta stay pure. And the way you stay pure, you stay in the word. But God gives you that opportunity to stay pure. John 1 16 says, 
of the fullness have all we receive grace for grace. Grace is the most important thing in your salvation. It doesn't give you a license of sin. It gives you the ability to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we, we, we try to misconstrue it to say, well, we got grace, we'll just ask for forgiveness and everything's okay. True repentance, that means you stop what you're doing, turn around and go the other way. John 1.17 says, And the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. You'll, as you go along, and the older you get, you think it's going to get easier to be a, a Christian. No, it's not. It gets harder as you get older. You're more responsible. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption... That is in Christ Jesus. If you can't live the way you're supposed to, ask for grace. Lord, give me more grace. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And that faith is a gift. And the more you grow in the Lord, the stronger that faith gets. And the more grace you get. Not of works lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship. And people don't like to read that next verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That means that you, God ordains you to do right. Always do right. Two wrongs don't make a right. Do right. And that's the hardest thing for a human being to do is right. First John chapter 1 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Walk in the light. Where's the light? You got it right in front of you. Amen. King James 1611 Bible. I know a lot of people don't say, well, I like the easier read Bible. Study. Study for yourself. Quit taking people's, uh, listening to what other people tell you. Because they're usually wrong. Study for yourself. Ask the Lord Jesus Christ to show you, and He'll show you what Bible you should be reading from. Amen. Then comes the wedding day. The engagement. They're preparing each other to, to know each other. And now comes the wedding day. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 6, 16 says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven, with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And that's the most comforting words that you'll ever read, especially in this day and age when everything is going to hell. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 says, there, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such a thing, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace and without spot and blameless. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of, may receive of the things done in this body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. That's the actual, I believe that's, when, when you're talking about Jewish weddings, the first thing they do is they take their bride to, the, to their bridal chamber and they consummate the marriage. That's when everything is worked out and everything is, is, is she's found to be pure. That's when it's, that's when we get everything settled. 
And Romans chapter 4, 14, verse 10 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he's saying, worry about yourself. Worry about your own heart. Don't worry about the one sitting next to you. Worry about yourself. You're going to have to give an account for yourself, not for the person sitting beside you. Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. All my soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garment of salvation. He hath clothed, covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and the, and the bride adorneth herself with her jewels. When you get into this marriage thing, you'll find out that, that we're mentioned all over the Old Testament, but it was a mystery to the Jew. But you're in there all through the Old Testament because... Jesus Christ came to his own and his own received him not. And, and, you know, God knows everything. He knew you before you were born. He knew you before the foundations of the earth were even created. Jesus Christ had already determined to die for you. He loves us so much. In Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 11, is one of those, those um, about the marriage. It says, The voice of joy, and the voice of gladness, and the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for His mercy endureth forever. And them that shall bring sacrifice and praise, of praise unto the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return the captivity of the land as the, at the first, saith the Lord. In order for the, for the captivity of the land to be returned to the Israel, there has to be a wedding. And that wedding is us. I'm excited. I'm excited to stand face to face with my Savior. Every wedding has a wedding song. When you read uh, Revelation chapter 5, it says they sang a new song. And they, and they is us. We're standing before the throne of God and we're singing a new song. But the main chapter, that, or the main passage of Scripture that we're going to look at is Psalms chapter 45. It's about a wedding. I read this years ago and I thought, wow, that's us. I'm in there. That psalm is about me and you and the bride of Christ. It says, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is a pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God has blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with the glory and thy majesty and the majesty of ride prosperous or prosperous or, excuse me because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. Thereby the people fall under thee. Sounds familiar. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is the right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God hath Thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garment smell of myrrh and aloe and cassia out of the ivory palaces, whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters, and this is a plural daughter, 
were among the honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of ore. Hearken, O daughter, singular, and consider the incline of thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of, thy, of Tyre shall be there with gifts. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of rough gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework, and virgins, plural, her companions that follow her shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing they sh shall they be brought, they shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy father thy shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. And I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. That's us. What a, what a history we're going to have. What a legacy we're going to have. And it's going to last forever and ever and ever and ever. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, is a companion passage, but we're just going to read or the whole chapter of 19, but we're just going to read verse 6. It says, And I heard, as it were, a voice of great multitude, and a voice of many waters, and voices of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice. And give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Notice it says, to her was granted. It doesn't mean that she deserved it. It means that God, the Father, and the son granted her to wear clean and white and fine linen. It's not because of our righteousness. It's because of his. Everything in the Bible was about him. Amen. But he's going to be, we're co-heirs with him. The wedding guest. Every wedding has to have wedding guests. John the Baptist, when he was asked if he was the Messiah, in John chapter 3, verse 29, says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoice greatly because the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. John never claimed to be the bride. He's the friend of the bridegroom. There are three, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the, the Old Testament saints rose up there, went, went with Christ up into the glory. They're waiting for the bride. They're waiting for the day that God will say, Son, go get your bride. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 52, it says, that's where you'll find that. It says, when the graves were open, many bodies of the saints which slept arose, they couldn't go any farther than the blood. When the blood was shed and spilled on the mercy seat, they got out of their place. Jesus Christ went down there and freed them, and they went, went on up. They wandered on this earth for a little while, and then they ascended into heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first resurrection. Then we have another resurrection. Find that in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. It says, And I said unto him, Sir, 
thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These Old Test, these these um, tribulational saints, they're going to be raptured up. They're not part of the bride. That's you. They're the guest. Because there's going to be a great supper up there. And, and God calls them up. If you, uh, if you look at Luke chapter 12, verse 36, Jesus Christ describes what's going to happen. And he says, he says And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. He's already gotten married. These are guests. They're invited to the supper. That when he cometh and knock, he may open unto him immediately. That's, we're talking about you know, the story of the ten virgins. Five of them had oil and five of them didn't. Blessed are those servants from the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. During the tribulational period, period, they're going to be watching. They're wanting the Lord to come back and take them out of there. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet. That's the dinner. And will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch, he doesn't come in the first watch. That's us. We're part of the first resurrection. So you have a second, and you even have a third. That's the Jews that, that survive when Jesus Christ returns, and Israel is being attacked and, and surrounded by the armies of the world, and he comes back and just wipes them out and sets them free. But while we're eating dinner and having a good time and Rejoicing in our salvation and rejoicing in the Lord and, and, and the earth is now the Lord's. There's going to be a group of people that are in the heart of the earth screaming out in agony. Have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented by these flames. They're going to be in complete torment. We'll be in complete glory. There's opposites in the Bible. If you look at heaven, and then you look compare to hell, heaven will be the exact opposite of hell. The honeymoon. We barely got time for the honeymoon, but that's the most important part. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 7 says, In the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violence is taken by force. Jesus Christ is going to come down and take control of this earth. He's going to take control of his, his uh, creation. The devil is going to be cast into hell. Or the Antichrist will be cast into hell. The devil will be tied up for a little while, a thousand years. But you, remember I said, you know, in, the, in Corinthians, I think it's in chapter 10, it says that everything happened in the Old Testament was in samples for what's going to happen in the New Testament. Revelation says that he's going to make us priests and kings. We're going to have authority. If you look at Exodus chapter 18, verse 21, it says when Moses was being judged in the people, he finally got to the point where his father-in-law says, you're going to wear yourself out. Pick out, your, pick out the tribe's men that can judge and help you. He says, able men, men that fear God, men of truth, and hating covetousness. He says, 
place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. That's our heritage. What the way you serve God now will be determined will determine how you serve Him in eternity. Matthew chapter 25, verse 21 says, The Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. You say, well, I can't do that. You will, when you get your glorified body. There's a lot of things I can't do, but I mean, I've heard preachers preach about, you know, some of the old, older women say, well, I can't ride a horse. You will when you ride that, you get your new glorified body, you'll be able to ride between the ears of that horse if you want to. But we're, we're on our way. We're so close to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we've got to keep our minds on Him. Let's pray. Our dear and Father, Lord, we thank You, Lord, for this day. We thank You, Lord, for this message. I pray that it was an encouragement. I pray that, Lord, that for our pastor as he preaches that, and teach, teaches us the Word of God, I pray that we'll take it and apply it to our hearts. And, Lord, help us to rejoice. The clock's almost at four. The thief is about to come. Help us to be ready. Help us to be watching. And help us to be right with thee. For us in Jesus Christ. Amen.